everybody. Um, I barely, barely made it. Uh, those of you who were on the same flight know what I'm talking about. Um, I'll still, I'll still start this talk uh, with a slightly controversial question, right? And that question goes, um, why did I have to come here? I let that sit there, wait until at least one of you seems slightly annoyed. And then I'll rephrase this, right? Um, instead of saying, I'm obviously super excited to be here, right? <laughs> I'm obviously super excited to be here. Um, um, instead of why did I have to come here, right? The question is, uh, do I really need to be here? And by that, I mean, do I really need to be here physically, right? And this has to do, um, you know, with the, with the current climate um, and the impact of us traveling around the world, right? Uh, in general, um, transportation makes up for a large chunk of um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, I just flew here from Zurich, that's, uh, I don't know, close to 10,000 kilometers. I'll keep on going to Seoul and then uh, go around the world once, so I feel very bad about all of this. Um, and so the, the, the question really is, isn't there something that we can do? Of course, I could hop on Skype. Uh, your experience might be slightly different. Um, my experience also would be very different. Right, I had a, very, a set of very enjoyable uh, meetings this morning, um, another obstacle to make it on time. Um, so the, the question really that I'm asking, I guess, is uh, um, what if we had a technology right, that was uh, sufficiently advanced so that I don't actually have to uh, hop on a plane every time I want to talk to some, some folks at Stanford? Um, I'm going to start and set myself up for failure by uh, borrowing some, some footage from Disney, right? But the question really is, um, what if that technology was so uh, sufficiently advanced that, would we, be, that we would believe um, that someone who's very far away, in this case an entire galaxy away, um, feels real, uh, looks real, and kind of can convince us to a degree where, uh, you know, this guy gets pretty angry. Um, and uh, so I, I would actually argue that this technology exists, but it exists only in principle, right? And uh, what I'm talking about is augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, I guess in 2019 we call it XR, um, whatever you want to call it. But uh, at least um, the technology carries the potential to drastically cut down on, on um, transportation. So... Um, now, uh, that's Disney's version uh, of mixed reality. Um, I want to roll back uh, by roughly 16 years or so and talk a little bit about the reality, uh, about the reality of mixed reality when I was even an undergrad student. Um, uh, as a warning, right, it looks uh, sufficiently, sufficiently terrible that you don't believe my whole story that this is a viable technology, but it serves as a lens to understand what the current challenges are um, in the field. So this is a, a video of a system that we built in uh, Munich uh, when I was an undergrad research assistant in 2003. And it's admittedly a little bit silly, right? So what you see is a, is a herd of virtual sheep um, that are out on the, uh, on the pasture they kind of uh, flock together, so there's uh, um, you know, almost, if you want, a little bit of AI. Um, there's a tangible user interface here, right? And now the uh, virtual sheep start flocking uh, to, the, to the physical uh, Duplo sheep that we introduced. Um, and there's all sorts of components uh, we'll, we'll carry on in a, in a little while. So this was called a pocket PC. Uh, maybe some of you old enough uh, remember this. Um, which allowed you to, to pick these uh, little guys up from their virtual pasture, um, inspect them a little bit more closely, and then set them free again. Here's um, a multimodal interface, right? You would point and, and kind of say something along the lines of spawn, and then a new sheep was, uh, was spawned. Um, you could also kill them. <laughs> there we go. Um, and then, of course, there's kind of the, the, the mixed reality part, right? So here's three-dimensional views into that scene. Um, either with uh, portable um, displays that you can track in, in 3D, move around, um, or head-mounted displays. So this is kind of the, the view through, uh, film through the head-mounted display. Um, I guess all we could think of in terms of, of doing with this kind of technology was to dunk sheep into virtual color buckets um, and then let them go again. But it's all, it has kind of all the ingredients of a modern uh, mixed reality system. 
Um, so uh, yeah, while I was digging through uh, this old video, I found a few, uh, few gems out there uh, that have nothing to do with the rest of my talk. I still share them with you. Finding number one uh, was that in 2003, I had even shittier haircut than today. <laughs> Um, and then here, this is for the, for the people in the wearable uh, sub-community of HCI. Who's this? Yeah, that's Starner. That, that's Starner. Um, and so the anecdote that goes with this picture is we gave him the whole demo that I just showed you a video of. Um, and so I had no idea who he was. He's an undergrad student, right? He's wearing this big computer here, uh, display, had like some, some data glove or, or Twiddler input kind of goes through the whole motion and then looks at me and says like, don't overdo the weird stuff. And I was like, what? I didn't, I had no idea that what he was talking about was the content of the demo and was not the technology. I assumed he was talking about the technology and that's the guy that looks like a cyborg, right? So anyways, um, what I'm trying to get at is, uh, there's obviously a promise, there's lots of progress that was being made Right, 2003 till now, 16 years, if you put on a HoloLens, um, the experience that you'll have today is much more polished, is much better um, than back then, but there's still, um, there's still quite a lot of issues to overcome. Um, and one of the things I believe hasn't changed since then has to do uh, with this quote. It comes from my sister. Um, so she saw this, uh, this demo and kind of afterwards we talked a little bit about it. And then she said, uh, you know, your demo, um, it gave me nightmares, <laughs> right? And so this is uh, what I guess people in HCI and in, in robotics and other uh, communities call the uncanny valley, that it's kind of to some degree so realistic that you believe something is there, in this case, virtual sheep, but they're you know, not, not the real thing. Um, and so there's kind of uh, a, a conflict, a cognitive conflict that's hard to overcome for people. Um, and so I started digging into this a little bit deeper, talked to my advisor, uh, Gudrun Klinker, who's uh, relative, relatively influential in augmented reality. Um, and, and she said, you know, the practice of augmented reality uh, can be rather disappointing. And, and she was basically saying, well, it's very hard. And, and so the question is, why is it hard? So, uh, and there's unfortunately not a single answer, right? Otherwise we could set a whole lot of uh, smart PhD students to solve that one problem and then be done. Um, the answer as often is complexity, right? And in augmented reality, because you are so attuned to the real world, if a tiny little bit of your perception of the virtual elements of the augmentation are off, then you will detect it immediately, right? We're an outlier detection machine or mechanism. And so um, what we have to get right is not only one thing, but it's a whole bunch of things, right? So there's displays, there's uh, localiz localization and mapping, um, there's scene understanding, and of course there's the interface itself, so the interaction if you want. Um, so I'll, I'll, the last quote, I think, uh, for today comes from Steve Feiner, who a couple of years after this, uh, this sheep uh, paper kind of said to me, you know, it would only take one big uh, financial muscle to make all of this happen. Like everything else is there. Um, since then, I guess quite a few muscles have appeared um, and are pouring a lot of, uh, a lot of money into this uh, technology. So I guess time will tell if uh, Steve was right or not. Uh, I don't know yet. Um, but, but what's clear is that there is a lot of very tangible progress. Right? So we can assume that displays at the current rate um, that they are uh, improving in a couple of years will probably be not, maybe not a solved problem, but drastically improved and provide a drastically improved um, experience from now. Uh, likewise, in computer vision, um, there's lots of work um, happening that kind of now helps us digitize the world around us in very high fidelity and often um, almost in, in real time. Um, the same holds true kind of for understanding people, right? So this is work um, uh, by colleagues of mine at Microsoft Research that kind of capture the deformation of, of the surface really of humans as they move again in real time. And also uh, semantic scene understanding, right? Like seeing what, what are the objects surrounding us. These are all ingredients 
that I'm now, uh, for a simpli to simplify matters, are going to assume someone else will solve them. Right? So if, if, if you're working on this, I'm not uh, trying to insult you to say it's a solved problem, but I trust you that you will. Um, and then I kind of have to say this, right? I'm in HCI, uh, so then I have to say uh, the interface is the, is the thing that kind of remains unsolved to a large degree. Um, and that kind of sets up uh, the, the three areas, the technical areas that I want to talk about. Um, kind of input, this is what Michael alluded to. We do a lot of sensing, uh, sensing of human activity, um, kind of output. Uh, I will talk only very briefly about haptics here. And then um, a pair of papers that we just presented at WIST on adapting the virtual content depending on, on uh, the state that the user is in. OK, so let's get started um, with sensing. And obviously, right, like there is now commercial mixed reality systems out there. So there's also lots of people working on, um, on the sensing side. Here's a video. Let's see if we have sound um, of Microsoft's reveal of the HoloLens 2. I've seen many people put on HoloLens for the first time. And the first thing people do when they put on the device is they reach out their hands and try and touch the holograms. Right, this is Julia Schwartz, a uh, very talented researcher um, at, at Microsoft. And when she says this, I trust her. Um, and there, there really is something visceral, right? You, you see virtual objects appear in front of you for the first time. You want to go out and kind of touch them, maybe just to, to check whether they're real or not. Um, but this is also what we do with the real world. So bringing our hands kind of into uh, the virtual world is super important. And the way uh, this is done in HoloLens I've is... I've seen many people... There we go. Um, maybe you didn't even see the video. Uh, anyways, the way this is done in HoloLens is via a set of cameras that are built into the hardware that are looking out into the scene. Um, and uh, on HoloLens 1, you could do these kind of tapping gestures. In HoloLens 2, there's full hand pose estimation. This is great work. Um, Camera-based hand pose estimation is also improved in leaps and bounds. Um, but the interaction that this uh, necessitates kind of is, uh, I would say, for, for long-term use, um, only suitable if you're uh, from the areas where I stem from, because in Bavaria we do these kind of things, right? And that develops the type of muscles that you need um, for, for prolonged use of in-air gestures in front of you. And so this leads us kind of to an alternative way, right? All of the sensing projects that I'm going to talk about today are all about not using cameras. They're uh, about getting rid of this um, external instrumentation and still understanding humans in high fidelity. So the first, um, the first part, as I said, uh, I believe that, that hands are fairly important, um, is a paper that we presented at SIGGRAPH uh, this summer. Um, is basically a fully soft and stretchable uh, data glove, um, if you want, so a, a modern take on the data glove. Um, and this obviously does not require line of sight, right? It's uh, self-sensing, the sensing elements attached to that glove, um, comfortable to wear or somewhat comfortable for a research prototype, but um, fairly accurate in reconstructing the hand pose um, of the wearer in real time, right? Which makes it um, an interesting mode or an interesting mean for uh, systems like VR, uh, mixed reality systems. And it has some nice uh, properties that you can't get uh, with the camera, right? For example, this thing would, uh, every camera-based system would topple over as soon as you're um, looking at people actually manipulating objects, which in the mixed reality setting seems somewhat silly. Um, of course, in uh, interaction in the dark, um, uh, fast motion, and occlusions are some of the properties that kind of speak for self-sensing technology rather than um, outside in. Um, yeah, the, uh, the uh, sensing hardware, if you want, um, is based on a custom-made uh, capacitive elastomer um, array. And this is not the first one you've seen. There's a company, StretchSense, from New Zealand that makes um, PDMS-based or silicon-based um, capacitive sensors by layering um, conductive, non-conductive, and conductive silicon on top of each other, and then measuring um, the, the resistance, the ch uh, sorry, the change in capacitance as you stretch um, this 1D sensor. 
However, uh, what we needed was a dense arrangement of these to capture all the degrees of free freedom of the human hand or of, of the human body, if you want. Um, so what we uh, went out, uh, we went out, did a little bit of, of research, couldn't find anything, and ended up building our own. So what you see here is, is a dense uh, capacitor array, array. So each of the little circles on this thing up there is uh, one set of electrodes that form a capacitor. Uh, it's fully stretchable. If you change the, the area of any of these capacitors, you get a corresponding change in capacitance. Um, yeah, and then a, a custom readout uh, scheme basically allows us to form this dense matrix and uh, measure the change in area for each of the elements in, um, in this matrix. Right, um, just very briefly uh, how to make one, one of these things, maybe you want to go, go out there and do that yourself, uh, involves actually only techniques that, uh, you know, a custom fabric uh, standard fabrication lab will have. So first you pour um, one layer of silicon on a sheet of glass. Um, this is the insulating layer, of course. Uh, on top of this, we kind of cast another layer um, of silicon that has um, conductive elements, uh, carbon black in it, that makes it black, but also um, uh, conductive to electricity. And a st standard laser cutter can then be used to etch out the traces, basically, of that layer. And then you rinse and repeat, um, pouring another layer of non-conductive silicon, conductive and so forth, um, until you end up with this um, dense array. Right, and then in this first paper, uh, talk 19, that's all we did. We kind of wrapped it around uh, and measured kind of the deformation of wrists and, and elbows and so forth. And uh, together with a, uh, with a data-driven technique, I'm not going to talk about this, you then kind of get these uh, dense deformations um, for, for elbows, wrists, and so forth. But of course, um, I kind of set out to talk about high degree of freedom um, interactions. Hands in particular, so I want to talk a little bit about how we extended this work then to make that actual glove. Um, so first of all, here's the, the new design, right? So what you see is basically the two conductive layers um, with vertical and horizontal elements, the little black boxes. Those are going to be the sensors, if you want, in the end. Um, aligning them kind of gives you a dense array of uh, 44 stretch sensing elements that are roughly aligned with the joints in the human hand, but they're not directly on top of, of each of the joints, and it gives you a little bit of redundancy in the data. If you compare this with uh, the things that you can buy to do today, um, you have an, an over-complete set of sensing elements. Um, so the Manos VR here has 10 bend sensors and then uses two IMUs. Um, and the Cyber Glove over there has 10, 22 flex sensors that are carefully designed to align with the degrees of freedom of the hand. Um, the fabrication process here is uh, more or less the same, right? Re repeated casting of individual layers of silicon, um, laser etching of the traces. Um, but if you try to put this on, on human skin, silicon is actually very sticky. You may be able to get that on once. You probably will not be able to get it off, uh, at least not in a functioning state. Um, and so uh, there's a second part to this where we basically create parts um, of a glove. Um, everything has to be flat, right, because alignment is super important. So we basically create a flat, flat, unrolled glove, stick the silicone on top, or glue the silicone on top, and then you end up um, with, this, with this data glove. Um, what's important to remember at this point is that this now gives you uh, 44 area changes, or changes in capacitance as a response to the underlying hand deforming. Um, and this is, uh, this is not enough to reconstruct the human hand because it doesn't have any information in terms of is the stretch happening in this direction or in that direction, and there's no direct uh, measurement of flex. Um, so we combine this raw data um, with a data-driven um, hand pose estimation technique, so uh, basically a neural network that takes the raw sensor data and predicts the hand pose. Um, with all things uh, machine learning, right, you kind of need the architecture, you need the data, 
um, and you need some form of learning procedure. I'm briefly going to talk about where the data comes from. Here we basically just exploit the fact um, that, well, the glove is very thin and doesn't really change the appearance of the human hand, uh, in particular not if you're using a depth camera, right? So we could use an existing um, depth camera-based uh, hand pose estimation system to, correct, to collect ground truth data. So we get these um, sensor readings um, and a pose from, from the depth camera-based system. With this uh, pair of uh, ground truth data, we first um, feed the raw sensor readings into, um, into a simple min-max normalization. Um, and this is, this is necessary for personalization, right? Everybody has different hand sizes. Um, we can uh, just take those and collect lots and lots of data uh, and then train the neural network, or you can try to take out the personal differences. Um, and this is what this, the simple normalization scheme, scheme does. Importantly, um, we then arrange these uh, things in these uh, input stretch maps. Um, if you go back or recall the layout of the sensor, we had horizontal and vertically aligned sensing elements, and these are represented uh, by these two input images. Um, and that's important because this form of representation allows the neural network, which in our case is not, nothing special, um, it's an encoder-decoder architecture, um, but it allows this network to reason spatially about the data, right? Because the, uh, the sensing elements are roughly aligned with the joints of the human hand. So you can, um, in the output space, also encode the spatial relationship, right? So we know roughly that this sensing element corresponds to the joint angle um, of, of a particular part of the human hand. So we take the input pose and also encode it in an image um, so that the network can, can exploit these spatial correspondences. And that also allows us uh, to train uh, this network with a simple per pixel based loss. So we know basically which pixel corresponds to which part of the hand. Um, and we experimentally show that that really works much better than taking raw, um, raw sensor readings to joint angles. Okay, so uh, that's, that's roughly how that works. Um, what we're showing here is that it also generalizes. So this is um, our model trained on the green glove. And now Oliver went uh, through all the pain to build a red one to show you <laughs> that uh, you can actually uh, reuse this model across different people, right? So this is uh, trained on data from a different glove um, and then tested on, on someone else. In terms of um, applications, I kind of mentioned some of them, or application scenarios, I mentioned some of them. Um, but obviously, the strengths of this technology, just to recap, kind of lies in the ability to, to detect uh, continuous hand pose in the presence of objects, right? Uh, Fine-grained manipulations that um, are difficult to do um, with uh, camera-based systems. And uh, so there's, there's kind of lots of exciting um, applications in VR and so forth that we're eager to explore going forward. Um, so that's kind of hands. Um, I'm going to uh, go back to my theme of, uh, of telepresence, right? And I'm going to reuse my last Star Wars reference for today. Second to last, sorry. Um, second to last. So, right, like, of course, if we're, if we're imagining this setting, right, that we're attending a meeting and some of us are, are here uh, physically, some of us are here virtually, then a set of disembodied hands would probably not quite do it. Um, so the, the rest of the body you also want to, uh, want to be able to see. And so um, let, me, let me briefly talk about how we could do this in a way that, again, does not require external sensing. Right? So here's um, um, an approach that relies entirely on body-worn sensors. Um, of course, if you just want to pop into a video conferencing session, talk to someone else uh, somewhere across the world, you want to do this without huge setup time. So what we're trying to do is to use as few sensing elements as possible. Right? So you're, uh, you're quickly set up. Um, and so uh, in, in this project, we use six IMUs. Um, position them on the body, and then try to reconstruct the full body pose um, in real time. 
right? Um, here's a little bit of, uh, of a preview of the system. Um, again, has the advantage that it kind of works in settings where typical camera-based systems do not work. Unconventional poses is uh, what we're trying to show here. Occlusions, right, sitting down at the table maybe where, where parts of the, the body would be uh, not visible at all. Um, it turns out that uh, this is actually a pretty hard problem. Um, and this is due to the fact that in contrast to the glove-based work, you're now dealing with a fully under-constrained post space. Right? So IMUs only give you orientation data. They do not give you uh, positional data. So if you kind of look at um, this kind of motion versus um, this, this motion over here and the resulting end poses, the orientation is exactly the same or, or almost the same whereas uh, you have very different, um, different poses and disambiguating um, these measurements over time is, uh, is the, the core difficulty of that problem. Um, I'm not gonna talk in, in much detail about this works, again, this data architecture uh, and losses. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit um, about the architecture just so, so that you have a, a, an idea of how this works in the first place. Um, what we use again is, uh, is here a recurrent neural network. So we have time um, and at training time, we look at the whole time series. Um, and then we have uh, these inputs. This is orientation and accelerations from the IMUs. Uh, two layers of recurrent network cells that pass the information forward and backward. Um, and then the outputs are full body poses, right? So the, um, the degrees of freedom of all the joints in the human skeleton. Um, what's, uh, what's interesting in this architecture is this forward-backward uh, forward -backward design. So these blue cells basically pass information forward through time and then through the two layers, and then you have a set of backward cells, which at training time uh, helps to really exploit the temporal consistency, right? We're not uh, moving our arms and, and legs in random ways, but there's temporal consistency. Um, and then there's a set of, uh, of cross connections, um, which, yeah, th these guys over here, um, which actually is fairly important to exchange this information to get real-time use. If you don't do that, um, you can only use this, uh, this model in offline mode. Right, so some of the results that you'll see in the paper are generated in the training setting. You have the whole sequence available, um, and then you output all the poses in one go. Um, for real-time use, of course, you cannot do this, and it turns out with uh, the, these cross connections, um, you can use this model in a sliding window approach. Right, so you move uh, through time, sliding window of uh, of um, IMU sensor readings and then uh, sequentially output the, the poses, <coughs> right? And so here's the, the, proofs, the proof in the Lastly, pudding. Lastly, we show Ooh. results from our live demo. Um, yeah, where you kind of see the whole setup thing, a little sped up, um, putting on the IMUs, calibrating, um, and then uh, in real time predicting the pose. There's quite a bit of latency here. Some of this is simply due to the fact that we use a projection engine, but some of it also comes from the sliding window approach. There's also a little bit of um, systematic underestimation, um, and this is because we don't have any positional data, right? This is just acceleration um, and, and orientations. Okay. If you were to ablate this, like if you were to remove one, two, or three of these sensors, like how, how close would you get to this kind of estimation? Like how, how low can you go? Um, so it depends on how you parameterize the human body, of course. Um, typically it has seven, uh, 17 bones or so. So if you put 17 IMUs on the body, you fully constrain the post space, right? Because they're all connected and then it's pure rotation. Um, if you go down, uh, anywhere below this, you already need some prior, some skeletal prior um, to fit this. Uh, we're using six IMUs. Uh, with five, um, you lose the head, right? And then, you know, it moves a little bit, but it doesn't move in the way that, that you do it. Um, and any, any below this, uh, you lose, you know, the limbs, yes, basically. But 
What you could imagine is maybe uh, in a VR setting, you have a virtual reality headset uh, already has IMUs, your smartwatch has an IMU, so you only need one further IMU to get the upper body in relatively high fidelity and without uh, you know, needing the camera seeing the hands. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so these are kind of uh, two of the many projects that we're kind of doing in giving machines an idea of uh, what humans do. Um, I want to talk about uh, slightly different things. Um, but the reason um, why we're looking at so many different ways to, to uh, basically perceive human, human activities from hand pose to full body pose, uh, recently there's a lot of work on eye gaze estimation, is really to get an idea of the state of the user. Right? Um, some of it is observable, pose is, is observable, um, and then as soon as you go to higher functions, cognitive function, it becomes less and less observable. Um, but it turns out that at least some things, um, you know, like cognitive load and whatnot, there's methods on. Um, and the, the future idea is that you use these state observations or these assumptions about what state the user is in to actually proactively change uh, the information that you show. Right? Um, and so I want to talk about um, some work in UI adaptation that now, um, assuming that you have information about the state of the user, um, adjusts uh, the user interface. Again, in the setting of, of mixed reality, I think, is where this makes the most sense. Of course, adaptive UIs uh, have been around for, for many decades, um, but you always run into the problem of spatial memory. Right? If I rearrange the apps on your phone, you're not going to like this because you don't know where uh, the particular apps are. Um, if you consider kind of uh, wearing a, a mixed reality headset all day long, I don't know if you would consider doing this, but let's assume uh, it, it became, becomes so comfortable that you would, then clearly the type of uh, information that you want to see in your living room, that you want to see in a more casual setting, is very different from the type of information that you would want to see in a safety, safety critical environment. Right? If I plaster your field of view with lots of information while you walk down a busy street, that's certainly not a good idea. Um, and so recently we started uh, turning small, uh, small rocks in this space. There were two papers uh, at WIST this year. I understand that David uh, Lindelbauer, the first author on one of them, came through here a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but I am going to talk about um, the second paper um, by Christoph Gepard and colleagues, which kind of tries to uh, learn cooper cooperative personalized policies um, from gaze data. Right. Um, this is uh, in collaboration with Facebook, uh, Facebook, uh, Benko, and lots of other uh, colleagues. So the the setting here um, is again right. The, the promise of of mixed reality is that it shows you the right information at the right time, right? And it can do that anywhere, um, anywhere in the in your surroundings. Um, However, if you um, overdo this, uh, if you plaster uh, the user's field of view, um, this effect is kind of lost, right? That you have this, the, the right information at the right, of t uh, right, right time um, effect. And so this is really what we, uh, what we started to study here. Um, now, of course, if you know what the right information is, then maybe uh, with a heuristic you can come up with um, you know, an optimization scheme that, that does this, um, finding out what the right information is, is typically the hard problem. Um, and in particular, um, what, we, what we started looking into is um, an, an approach that looks at the labels, right, that you uh, attach to virtual objects, and it tries to only show you spatially uh, relevant labels. So this means if, if this is your focal point, then Will, you could simply limit uh, the labels to the fovea region, right, to the, the region where you actually see uh, with high level of detail. However, uh, depending on your task, a lot of the labels that you're showing here are not semantically relevant. Right? And so this is kind of what we're trying to, uh, to learn from data, is to not only use a, a simple heuristic of where are you looking, 
uh, in order to show you information, but also what um, are you trying to do, what are you trying to achieve um, in order to show you the right information um, at the correct uh, time. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this obviously kind of requires personalization. This requires task adapti adaptivity. Um, and, and our approach tries to learn these policies. So basically, the task is to show a label or not um, from gaze data only, right? So here, the green points um, is where a user is looking in a VR simulation. Um, and then uh, the agent has learned to basically not show any of the labels um, but those for, for wine in the setting, right? A particular category, right? Here the user is trying to find maybe a specific um, uh, kind of wine or the cheapest or, um, but, but this sort of um, is one of these very personalized task-specific policies. Importantly, there is no ground truth labels from the user. All we did was tell people the task and then observe what they do and then the, uh, the agent learns the policy without any other supervision. Um, and so this is, this is phrased as a model-free uh, reinforcement learning approach um, that basically determines when to show a label or not. So traditionally in reinforcement learning, right, you have an agent, um, it performs an action, the environment receives that action, and uh, then propagates a reward and a state change back to the agent. Um, and this is, in, in the standard setting, is often the environment is some form of physics simulation um, where uh, you basically use a game engine or whatnot, and the reward would then be task completion in terms of, oh, I want to walk from here to there. Right? Um, simulating users and user behavior fully, um, if, you, if you figure out how to do that, let me know. Um, so that's not really an option for us here. What we do instead is we actually treat the recordings of user behavior as the environment, right? So the, um, the basically the, the replay of human behavior, and in our case, gaze behavior, is what serves as an environment. Um, and then the agent, instead of trying to learn to copy uh, the behavior that the human is doing, tries to uh, cooperate with the human, tries to help. Okay, um, so here's the actual setting. Uh, here the task was to find the, the highest number um, in the labels of the green objects. And at, uh, at data collection time, all the objects are labeled. Right? Um, again, you see the little green dots, this is the, uh, the gaze behavior. Um, and that's all the data that we have. And then basically the method needs to figure out which of these labels are relevant and which aren't. Um, I'll briefly talk about the most interesting aspects um, of the method here. Um, so first, we kind of set up uh, this as a, uh, as a decision process, basically uh, define the state and action spaces, um, define our reward function, and then I'll briefly talk about the learning procedure. Okay, so um, what's important um, in, in terms of gaze uh, to remember is that there's ballistic motion in between fixations um, and the decision points are basically at the current fixation for the next fixation, right? When I'm looking at one object, I need to make a decision whether I'm going to label the, the next object um, in a particular gaze, um, gaze trajectory, right? So, um, and then most uh, commercial eye trackers uh, run at the fixed frame rate, so they will have um, these different time steps in between these decision points. But you're not actually interested in the in-between points, you're only interested at, uh, in fixation points. Um, so, so in our setup, we're only looking at um, fixation points, but they're temporarily now have varying distances to each other. Um, and this uh, technically turns this in a semi-Markov decision process um, where we're basically uh, only looking at fixations with uh, time varying distances. And so the states basically become uh, the fixations and the actions become um, deciding whether to label the, the next object or not. So if you want the, uh, the arcs along this, this graph here become your actions. That's the decision points. 
Okay. So um, in terms of uh, re uh, in terms of state and action spaces, um, the the way to think about this is that every object basically becomes the agent, and uh, the agent for every object in the scene makes a decision to show its label or not. Um, and this is done um, to actually reduce the size of the state and action space. So the the state um, basically entails the distance um, and the angle to the gaze point. Um, and it does this for, for each of the objects in the scene um, and the uh, angular velocity in order to make the decision uh, also based on the dynamics of the gaze. And the action um, is very simple, showing or hiding the label. Okay, so the, maybe the ma ma most interesting thing is how you model uh, the reward. It's the most uh, uh, influential part, typically, in reinforcement learning. Um, the reward function here has two objectives, right? It's uh, supposed to minimize the visual clutter to, uh, to not overload users, but show labels when you need them, right? If you cannot perform your task anymore, it's, it's sort of useless. So, um, and, and hence we weigh them slightly differently. Minimizing visual clutter gives a little bit of reward. Um, showing the correct label gives lots of reward. And um, uh, in contrast, doing, getting this wrong, right? Like showing the label when you, should have, uh, when you should not have shown the label gives you a large negative reward. And um, not showing a label gives you a small negative reward. So there's basically four cases, right? Your action is show. Um, and the user actually looks at that label uh, that gives a high reward. Um, the other option is you kind of show the label, but the user does not actually look at it. It's not great, but it's not terrible. Um, so this gives a small negative reward. Um, the third option is you decide to hide that label, uh, but the user actually looks at it. That will give large negative reward. And then the last option is that you hide the label and the user does not actually look at it. So you filtered information correctly and you get a, a, a small reward. OK. Um, here's kind of visualization of uh, the learning procedure. We basically record the gaze trajectories. We randomly sample uh, from our recorded trajectories. And then at each of the um, fixations basically make a decision whether we're going to show the label of this object here, right, that now received this, uh, this coordinate system. And so um, in the beginning, the agent will make lots of uh, wrong decisions, such as showing the label when you're not even, when you're not yet there, when you're not fixating the label, um, and will accumulate uh, penalization for this. Um, but eventually, as we uh, go through or experience this particular gaze trajectory several times, um, it will start making better decisions. Um, and in this case, uh, after experiencing this particular trajectory three times, it kind of gets the decision process right, shows the label only when the uh, user is about to fixate um, onto that label. OK, um, that's kind of how that method works. Um, again, here's uh, the, the uh, result that you saw earlier. Only, only now um, uh, we're going to try a slightly more different task, where a difficult task where it's not only wine, but all alcoholic beverages. Right? And so here, um, here you see that the relevant labels are shown. There's a little bit more flicker, right? Because um, potentially also training time, users are not 100% correct and only looking at the uh, things that they're interested in. But it selectively shows the labels for, for the correct um, categories. Here's um, a slightly more, uh, more realistic scene. I'm showing you this fully labeled to realize that um, objects are occluding each other's, labels are occluding each other's, and the spatial differences are much smaller. Right? So um, this means that uh, this task is much harder than the nicely spaced uh, uh, shopping scenario from earlier. And again, um, here, uh, looking for this toy plane, kind of uh, the agent is able to correctly figure out which of the labels to show. Right? So um, again, tries to support the user in finding the toy plane that has the highest uh, number attached to it. 
and it um, filters out all the information that's unnecessary for this task and only shows it at the correct, um, correct time. Okay, um, we said we have until 12, 12.30. 30. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll go on to uh, talk about the third section, but I'll talk about that only very, very briefly. Um, because uh, I want to be, be sure that we have time for questions. So, um, yeah, so we kind of have input, we have sensing, we have kind of adaptation of user interfaces. There's a third component that's important in communication, right, and that is feeling, that is feeling of presence of either virtual objects or, um, or uh, maybe even people, and we've done uh, now quite a lot of work on, on haptics to communicate this presence of, of virtual objects. Um, almost tempted to say, uh, I'll leave it at this slide, but I'll, I'll pick one of the projects and talk about that a little bit. Um, this is work um, that spans over several papers uh, where we first developed a novel type of actuator. Um, and then started to miniaturize it further and further so that you get, can get a significant density. Um, and then we combine this in, uh, in a set of psychophysical experiments to figure out where is it actually important to provide haptic feedback to portray a particular sensation. Right, so this is kind of an experimental setup where um, you, you place these individual, let's call them taxels, um, on the hand, um, again, you track the human hand and then you play different types of sensations, right? So there's high frequency in the bottom right, you kind of see the, the virtual scene, high frequency texture, uh, low frequency texture with different orientations and impact, right? So touching the mouse here is very different from, from exploring um, texture on, on these objects. Okay, so the way this, thing's, this thing works is basically a permanent magnet that um, is sandwiched between two, um, two latching plates. You put power on one of these latching plates that uh, orients the magnetic field so that uh, the, the taxel either retracts um, or uh, goes down to the other side. Importantly, you only need to put energy into the system to switch it. Right? So you do not need to um, put any power when it's in the stable state. So it's a bistable actuator um, that can switch at high frequencies, but can also render permanent contact. Um, yeah, and so these things can then be uh, placed at different positions on the hand. Uh, and can play two different types of modes if you want. Right? So the first one is pulse mode which you see here slowed down, um, where you kind of hit the user and then you retract the taxel again and then you can do that at different um, frequencies. Um, and the other one is, is a contact mode where you basically latch the, the actuator and then you leave it there. Um, and we use these, as I said before, um, the pulse mode to play kind of haptic patterns or spatial haptic patterns and um, the second mode to render permanent contact, right? Because it kind of stays there and, and keeps in contact with your skin. Um, yeah, I I'll, won't talk uh, about the details of the experiments, but what's interesting here, um, and I'll invite you to read the paper, is that you can now play around with the density of these on the hand. You can play around with the dynamics um, of how you spatially and temporally actuate these. Um, and you can find out a little bit of how many of them do you need to get to a degree where people can um, differentiate and, and um, understand different types of objects. Uh, so uh, we saw quite frequently that people were able to, to find the cup and the mouse and different objects without looking necessarily, um, that they can detect uh, the orientation and type of texture, right? So we played around by putting the wrong texture on on a feedback, uh, on a different object, so you can override the visual stimuli. Um, and overall, uh, this is a nice uh, research framework that lets you play around with haptic stimuli um, and trying to figure out which one may be important in order to kind of drive this overall idea of, of mixed reality systems that make you believe that you were there 
um, uh, bring that closer to reality. So with that, um, I'm going to use my last Star Wars reference um, <laughs> and say that uh, there is, despite you know, many decades of work, still lots of, uh, I hope, exciting things to do. Um, some progress is being made. Um, and both the technical problems that are there are interesting um, for research. Um, and I believe that there's lots of potential if we make uh, inroads in the, the correct aspects to kind of get to uh, a system that really allows us to change um, our habits in terms of um, traveling around the world at a whim. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you. And uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, I was hoping to hear more about your mobile work, um, work on mobile aspect of the AR. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I mean, the goal, I would say the goal of a lot of this, at least of the sensing work, is to kind of get to a state where it becomes mobile, right? Um, I think what, what uh, for, the, for this telepresence setting would be nice, right, is if I can walk down the street and you virtually walk right next to me while maybe you're sitting in a chair somewhere else, right? That's where all the, I think, the fidelity of understanding pose and whatnot comes in, um, where uh, also the design choices of sensors that can be worn on the body come in. Um, and ultimately, I think, uh, being able to go mobile is super important, yeah. Um, right, so I don't know if this really uh, answers your question. Um, but, you know, if it takes 10 seconds to put something on, right, you have a huge barrier. If it takes, uh, I don't know where the threshold is, but let's say one second or so, maybe I'm willing to do this on a repeated basis. Um, if I need to always go somewhere to use a system, I'm certainly not going to replace it, uh, use it to replace something else that, that I can already do today. Built about data club in college. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. My students were, you know, how people looked at us. Mm -hmm. um, so we did something else after that. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, again, uh, probably minimalism is the, the answer to some degree. Um, also, everything is good for something and not so good for something else. Uh, we're getting a lot of interest both from, you know, uh, the people in VR right now as an input mechanism, but also in the medical domain. This is basically, uh, this glove is a silicon glove. Um, you know, medical doctors wear quite often uh, gloves that are of equal thickness, of equal comfort uh, ratings. And so I think there's uh, definitely areas where you would wear a glove like this. But getting it as light, as unobtrusive, again, is, is key. I'm thinking of the, your gloves. Have you, um, have you tried using it in the sense of um, sign language, mm -hmm. where not only does it have um, mm -hmm. gestures, but also movements to mm -hmm. the body? Mm -hmm. Um, so, the, actually, sign language and being able to do the full, uh, let's say, ASL, American Sign Language Alphabet, is one of the main reasons why a couple of years ago I went away from pure gesture recognition to this uh, continuous post estimation, right? Because for, for signing, uh, you need dynamics. Um, the American Sign Language Alphabet has, I think, like eight uh, gestures that have temporal aspect to it, and that's hard to do if you're only looking for the shape. Right? And so um, that's one, one of the reasons, but uh, many of these direct manipulation type of uh, interaction scenarios, mixed reality, virtual reality, you really want more than just gestures. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I guess I was kind of wondering um, why, so you, you had the quote that, um, frankly, augmented reality is, is hard. Um, but also there's all this research going on to, to solve some of these problems. I was kind of wondering uh, what your thoughts on thoughts are on uh, how we can drive adoption of these kinds of technologies and 
is it um, on like researchers to, to build new technology, or is it, or is there some other like societal reason why um, mixed reality isn't as adopted as other competing technologies? Yeah, yeah, very good question. Thank you, um, and many questions at once. <laughs> uh, so. So yes, I mean, I said during the talk, right, I believe the hardness comes from complexity. Um, I don't think it's up to us to solve all the technical problems, right? Some things require so much financial and manpower, um, I would say displays, for example, um, that maybe they're done better in an industrial setting and you see rapid progress, right? Like what Oculus is doing, what Microsoft is doing right now really drives uh, the display side of things, I would say, at a much faster pace than what we did in over 20 years or so in research. Um, other things, uh, yeah, both at the technical level all the way to, you know, the interactions to the societal aspects. What do we actually use it for? What are the important dimensions, right, where we need to make progress? Um, these are probably questions where we have at least a say as well. Um, final adaption, I think, is, uh, is still quite a while out. Um, historically, if you look at uh, when have we adopted new things that we carry with us all the time, that happens very rarely in the history of mankind. Um, and I don't know when the time comes that we add a headset to this, maybe never, um, but maybe it will, but I think it's still, there's still lots of push that needs to happen. Last question. Oh, it's not. No, just last question. Oh, okay, for sure. Uh, what is the direction of the visual design of the interface going, like the heads-up display? Because, like, for me, something I would look forward to is, like, I would use this, where it's like I'm running errands in the grocery store, and it's like there might be a QR code or something like that, and it's like, okay, it shows like a small text box, the price, the description, reviews, or something like that. Like, instead of, like, a text box that has, like, aerial font, like something that's more, like, visual and... Know, um, easy for the, the user to read. So, like, where, what direction do you see this going visually? So, so do you mean the uh, the like industrial, the physical design, or the on-screen design? design? The interface. It's like, okay, I look at this model of wine and it shows like the description on the side. Like, is that kind of the main objective that you're going towards in terms of that virtual reality component? But like, used in the actual setting. Mm, I don't. I don't think we're necessarily quite this far yet, where we can uh, think of. Of visual, I, th I think like what you touch upon is is like a super important problem. That the question of how do you design for for the real world, right, um, and the complexity of it becomes very different from how do you design for a flat rectangle, right, where nothing changes or only the the data changes. Um, and this is definitely where we're going. You know, where we started to uh, really invest quite a bit of attention is in how to adapt the design. Right, uh, to different contexts. I think this is actually mandatory for a mixed reality to happen, yeah. right? Because you, as a designer, you cannot uh, decide uh, everything a priori. You don't know where the thing is going to be used. You don't know what the geometry of the scene is going to be. All those those kind of things. And and so I think this actually fundamentally changes how UI design needs to happen. All right. Uh, we'll be here for a couple minutes if you have any in-person questions. Uh, thanks for joining us all the way out here. Thank you.